Welcome to part one of our study on doctrines. You may well ask, why do we want to study doctrines of all things? It is because doctrines rule almost every aspect of our lives. Not many people know that, let alone know how to recognize all these doctrines and manage them effectively. If we understand the doctrines that regulate our lives and know how they work, we might be much better prepared in an, and in a better position to prevent people from misleading us. Let's begin by looking at a simplified definition of a doctrine. A doctrine could be defined as a collection of principles, precepts and rules that contains promises of punishment and promises of rewards. So let's do a small test. What is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word doctrine? Most people would immediately think about religion, I would imagine. Perhaps someone practicing law would also think about the different doctrines of the law. There are basically two types of doctrine. Doctrines that have promises and those that are without promises. Those without promises are usually doctrines of the law that are made up of principles only, which means that they merely state principles according to which the law should be interpreted. As an example, the doctrine of self-defense is such a doctrine without promises. Constitutional doctrines, such as the U.S. Constitution, usually contain only principles, and the promises of reward or punishment are contained in the laws that flow from the constitutional doctrine. The laws enacted by the legislature are also doctrines, but they seldom contain promises of reward. Their promises are almost always promises of punishment only. That is, if you do not violate the law, you are not affected. Only when you violate the precepts of the law are you in trouble. The rules that govern religious institutions, clubs and organizations are the doctrines that contain all the elements we mentioned in the definition. Principles, rules, instructions and promises of reward and promises of punishment. A social organization could have sanctions or even expulsion from the organization as a punishment in the event that a member misbehaves. Recognition and privileges are promised as rewards for those who are in good standing or those who provide extraordinary services to the organization. Religious organizations have two main divisions in their doctrinal structures. Their doctrines have a civil structure and also a spiritual structure. The civil structure deals with the visible here and now interaction with the religious organization's civil doctrine which is a lot like the social organization's doctrine and contains many of the same promises. You must behave, out you go. The spiritual structure deals with a life outside of this life, which is unique to religious doctrines. Promises in this part of the doctrine are not intended for the present life, but are promised for the life year after, the life after death, whether they are promises of punishment or reward. The separation between the religious organization's civil and spiritual doctrines is not absolute, but they interact with one another, fortunately, in a very simplistic manner. And that manner is, evidence of obedience to the spiritual is visible in the obedience of the civil. That means, if you are, according to the religious organization's principles and precepts, in good standing in what you do and say according to the civil doctrine, it serves as evidence that you are also in good standing in the spiritual. Is this evidence absolute? No, of course not, because there are no witnesses to observe, observe one's actions with the spiritual doctrine, to ascertain whether it is in stride with the civil behavior. If people wish to act in good standing in their civil conduct, but be violators in their spiritual conduct, it is seen as hypocrisy, provided one can determine that. The point is, we should not be hypocrites. We will deal with this point later in more detail. However, is the dual concept of a civil and spiritual structure unique to religious organizations only? This is a question to which non, not many people know the answer. What do you think? 
Let me ask the question a little differently while you think about the answer. Do all doctrines, regardless of their nature, have a civil and a spiritual structure? What do you think is the answer? The answer is, yes, they do. If you answered no, then listen up. If you answered yes, listen up too. And let me know if you agree with me. Let's consider the civil structure of a doctrine as the part one can see and do. And let's call it the fact part. And the spiritual structure as the unwritten part that goes beyond what is written. And call that the belief part. Okay? All right. It is only possible to approach a doctrine from two points of view. From the fact point and from the belief point. Approaching a doctrine from a point of fact gives one information and knowledge about the doctrine's language and its literal instructions and one is able to respond in word and deed. That means visibly. That is the simple language of the doctrine's rules, regulations and its promises and the visible responses to them. Approaching a doctrine from a point of belief refers to the understanding of the doctrine beyond the literal and beyond the simple language one can read in the document. One responds in obedience to this part of the doctrine with a heart, or one may also say with one's conviction. And remember that word conviction and how we apply it. To summarize, the civil and spiritual structures of a doctrine deal with what is written in the doctrine and on the one hand, and on the other hand, the enthusiasm and conviction with one, which one obeys the doctrine. That applies to all doctrines, regardless of their nature. Religious doctrines extend the point of belief to include matters of eternity, but the dual approach is the same for all doctrines. For example, Let's say you returned from the store and found that the cashier gave you $20 more in change than what, what were owed to you. What do you do? Do you drive back and return the money? Or do you keep it? There is no violation of the law here, because you were given the money. You didn't steal it. If you follow the fact of the law, you might not feel obligated to return the money at all. If, however, you follow the belief of the law, you will find an opportunity to return the money and perhaps not rest until you have rectified the cashier's error. In the latter case, you will be motivated by your conviction that the money is not yours, regardless how you received it. And you will do anything in your power to return the money to its lawful owner. I gave you this example as a heads up to explain the direction in which this study will go in investigating and studying the doctrines. If you subscribe to our show, then we will send you an email when the next episode of the study is published, which will be not less than once a week. That will save you a lot of time. Join us next time for part two, when the fun will really start. See you then.